So welcome back, everybody. And uh, I hope you had a great uh, break. The uh, aim today uh, is as follows. I mean, it's basically meant, uh, the meaning is to present the uh, uh, possible projects which we have, the, or the possible variants for project number two. There's also, there's always the possibility to actually uh, have a slightly different focus. However, it should fall within what we might call computational quantum mechanics. And uh, it should have uh, uh, many of the elements which we have discussed earlier, but we are very flexible in designing these projects. So what I've done is to propose uh, five uh, uh, different paths and I wanted to discuss these and present these to you today. And uh, what we could do afterwards is even to uh, uh, break out in smaller groups and uh, discuss in more detail the different variants. The um, uh, other thing which we have done normally, uh, if there is a majority of people who wants to focus on one specific project, then uh, if, if there are something like three, four, five, six people, then we would typically have dedicated lectures for that, or we would meet on, on the Thursdays and discuss the theory, which is needed to get people started. And then uh, we would then uh, move on and just uh, work on the projects for the rest of the semester. The um, uh, type of ways we've done this is that we have often uh, designed projects, so one to two projects we've seen which seem to attract uh, the interest of most people. And then we've just formed subgroups and then we've been working together and discussing the projects. So this is one possible path which we can follow. And, uh, but I would like you guys to take a look at the projects and uh, see what you think, digest uh, the topics I propose. And then we can have a kind of iterative uh, process where we discuss back and forth uh, how we actually solve these projects. And we can also set up separate Zoom sessions if that is something which fits better. Now, just a quick, quick reminder. So if you click on the doc folder here and you scroll down to projects, you when you go to 2023, obviously, and project two, you will find the, uh, uh, if you click on any of these, like uh, if you click on this uh, project, to quantum computing, you will find the HTML versions. Here you will find the LaTeX version and the PDF version, if that's what you prefer. Or if you prefer Jupyter Notebook or the project, you will find the same here. And also if you spot typos and so on, just let me know. The, uh, uh, so this is one of the places where you can find the source files. A Git pool, if you have uh, cloned the repository, does the job for you and gives you the latest update. Or alternatively, if you click on the link here, so if you do that, you would then uh, uh, get at the end, after we've done here, we uh, will have the different uh, projects, the different variants. And I wanted to say something about the different possibilities. So these are the five possibilities which we have set up. Uh, we've also uh, suggested a deadline, May 31. Uh, but uh, you probably know me pretty well now and we are normally flexible with deadlines. The most important thing is that we get your project so that we can grade in time and send the grades to the uh, study administration. And then typically they want the grades uh, sometimes in the middle of June till the end of June. So uh, we are always flexible with these deadlines, but look at them as a kind of tentative deadline and try to be done by then. Okay, so the uh, uh, projects which we have, uh, there are different variants, and I wanted to say a little bit about them on the whiteboard, so we can uh, look at things with more ease. Uh, you can look at the text here and then uh, discuss them among yourself and see which one uh, you would prefer. But let me now bring up the whiteboard here, and then you can... Uh, And I can say a little bit more about the different variants which we have. So let me get that one. So the uh, 
there is one variant which we might call the, uh, the traditional path. And this is an extension of uh, the first project, extension of uh, project one, and I just write this P1, but now with fermions. So that means that what you need in this specific case is one, you can use the uh, everything you developed in project one. So everything you did, blocking, uh, important sampling, uh, optimization part, parallelization, etc., uh, can be reused from P1. But what you would need now is actually to add a new wave function. So you would change the wave function ansatz, which we label as a psi of t. And this uh, is given now in terms of the various positions of the different particles up to an n. And then you have these variational parameters, alpha, uh, from a bosonic uh, wave function, which is actually called a permanent. So that's a symmetric wave function from a boson system. to a anti-symmetrized wave function, to an anti-symmetrized psi of t. So the anti-symmetry is something you would typically bake in in a, uh, a specific way. So the uh, wave function you have for the uh, uh, two particle correlations or what we call the correlated part of the wave function or the Jastro factor or the Pade Jastro factor as it's also called depending on the mathematical form you opt for. This is a symmetric wave function. So it's symmetric under the interchange of two particles. However, uh, if you want the anti-symmetry, the way you would bake that in is to define a so-called Slater determinant. So a determinant, if you now have the columns to represent a specific particle, when you interchange the columns, then that gives you a change in sign. And that gives you the right way of expressing the anti-symmetry, starting with a product of single particle wave functions. So this is a kind of continuation of uh, project number one. It's perhaps the easiest path uh, the only complication is actually to set up this Slater determinant and simulate a system of fermions. Uh, we are going to look at a specific system, uh, and I will say a little bit about that specific system now. So you would then define a so-called determinant or Slater determinant, which is the way you can encode the anti-symmetry. So remember again that everything you do in quantum mechanics, since you don't have the exact solution, is to guess on a specific form. And that specific form of the wave function needs to obey some specific symmetries. So this is defined as so-called Slater determinant. And that means that the trial wave function then, as a function of different variational parameters and a given number of particles, up to an Rn, and some specific variational parameters is going to be given by the following form, one divided by the square root of the number of particles. And then you can let either the columns or the rows represent the particle number. So you will now have a specific quantum number, which we are going to label as a quantum number uh, one here. And then we have a particle R1. And then we have another quantum number two here. With, this will be still particle one. So the columns now are used to label the different quantum numbers which we have. No, the different particles, sorry. And this uh, up to n here, that would represent the quantum numbers in addition to the positions of the particles. So this will go up to R, R of n. And this continues now, so you would have a same single particle states you can occupy. Remember now that when we did bosons, we had just a set of single particle states. 
which we use again and again, that means that all particles could be in the lowest lying state. So this would now be particle two, and then you see the pattern here, and this goes up to one, and then we have the final one, or n. So this is just a determinant, and then we have two here, r2, down to psi of n of r of n. And then we have n, sorry, this should n, and then we have r of n here. So this is particle two, and this is particle n. So this is the determinant. And when you do quantum mechanics, the, uh, these different particle, these different quantum numbers, they represent uh, single particle states which the particle can move in. Now, the system which I would like to suggest is a system which is very popular now in uh, solid state physics. And these are two dimensional quantum dots. So these are confined electrons normally, but it could also be ions or any type of fermions, could be protons if you want to, which can be confined in small regions and where the trapping potential looks like a harmonic oscillator. And this is pretty close to what we had in project one. So that means that we have a harmonic oscillator again, but now we have to be a little bit careful because in project number one, they could all be in the same single particle slot. So what does that mean? So we are going to look at a two-dimensional uh, quantum dot system. Uh, we could, uh, if you prefer, and you want to do a one-dimensional one, this is also possible because one of the projects which we have, the time-dependent project, deals actually with one-dimensional harmonic oscillator potentials. So you could actually even make a comparison if somebody prefers to do the uh, time-dependent Hartree-Fock calculation, which is another variant, uh, we can look at similar systems. But the Hamiltonian in this case now is going to be given by a uh, unperturbed part, which is going to be the harmonic oscillator potential plus kinetic energy of the single particles. And then we have an interaction part. So this H0, is now going to be a two-dimensional harmonic oscillator where we now sum over the number of particles. And then we have the H bar, if we now insist on the units and we are going to look at the same type of particles. So this is the second derivative. And then we have a harmonic oscillator potential, which is going to be given by Ri squared. So that's this piece. And now we are going to have degrees of freedom and when you're setting up the code, it's gonna be convenient to actually do it and run everything in Cartesian coordinates. So we would then have uh, this R of I squared, which is going to be X I squared plus Y I squared, as we had before. And uh, the only distinction now is that we are not going with project one, is that we are not going to do this in one uh, dimension or three dimensions but we're gonna stay with two dimensions. However, if you think you would like to explore another type of system, feel free to do that. So this is just a general framework and the type of Hamiltonian which we're going to use is now going to be simply uh, something which can be tailored to your own research interests. And the interaction piece, this H of I, is now going to be a uh, so-called Coulomb potential or Coulomb interaction, as we often call it. And this is a double sum where we sum over uh, the different particles. And this contains now the, uh, since this is gonna be a system of identical particles, it's gonna be an interaction which is repulsive. So this will contain now a constant K of E squared divided by the uh, absolute value of the relative distance. And just let me quickly remind you of this quantity here. So this is basically in two dimensions. It's gonna be xi minus xj squared plus yi minus yj squared. Now with the uh, harmonic oscillator, what we have to pay attention to now, if we look at this h0, so this h0 can then be rewritten in terms of uh, 
what we are going to call, so the sum goes up to the number of particles, a double sum. It can be rewritten in terms of uh, a one-body operator. And where these one-body operators, H0, acting, and now I'm skipping R, acting on a given state alpha of uh, Ri, is going to be given by an epsilon alpha of phi alpha of Ri. And these functions which we have here, they are going to be the harmonic oscillator ones. So I'm spending a little bit time on this topic here because we are going to reuse this uh, type of system in uh, two other projects as well. Now, when you look at the harmonic oscillator and when you have a system of fermions and you elongate the single particle energies, so this epsilon alphas, they are going to be given by h bar omega. And since we are in two dimensions, this is going to be given by n x alpha plus n y alpha plus one. So this is the un, normally what we call the unperturbed energy or the non-interacting energy. And in this specific case, if you look at these functions uh, phi of alpha, if you now go back again, these functions are going to be given here in here, and they will define the Slater determinant, which you are going to set up. So the technicality here, the difficult thing is actually to keep track of the different columns and different rows and set up the uh, simulation of a determinant in the most efficient way. And these are things which we will discuss. And uh, it there are also uh, lectures and guidelines on how to set up this Slater determinant. So in a certain sense, this is just the uh, project number one, but now interchanging uh, a bosonic system with a uh, fermionic system. Now, these quantum dot systems are popular systems for simulations of uh, uh, quantum computer systems. So quantum dots are seen as uh, possible candidates for making quantum gates and quantum circuits. Uh, similarly, this system here can also mimic uh, a so-called uh, ion trap. And ion traps are also popular systems for making quantum gates and quantum circuits. And there's a lot of ongoing research on the uh, quantum mechanics of these type of systems. So then, if you look at these single particle energies now, uh, the way they are going to look like when we now uh, set up these quantum numbers. So if we now take nx of this number uh, or ny, these are going to take numbers which go from zero to and up to infinity. So if we make a plot now, of the spectrum which you might get. So we would have a uh, degeneracy here for the ground state, nx equal to ny equal to zero. And in this specific situation, you can actually accommodate two electrons. So one will spin up and one will spin down. So that's a type of system you can have uh, if you have only two electrons. So you could then assume that the ground state wave function is modeled by two electrons being placed in the lowest harmonic oscillator state. So that's an ansatz for your Slater determinant. So if you take n equal to two then, then this Slater determinant, which we set up, this psi of t would be one divided by square root of two factorial, and then you would have a state where we now are going to put nx and ny equal zero. So we're gonna write this as zero, zero. So this represents the two quantum numbers. And remember now that when you are in one dimension, you will typically have one quantum number because you have one spatial degree of, of freedom. When you go in two dimensions, you will typically have two quantum numbers, et cetera, et cetera. So this now represents the position of particle one. And then, uh, we should add to this spin. So this is spin up and this zero zero is then spin down. And this is an R1. And then we have the next state here, which is a zero zero with spin up. And then we have a particle two here. And then psi zero zero 
and there's a spin down. And now we need to rewrite this in terms of uh, uh, an anti-symmetrized wave function where this single particle states, this psi zero zero of spin is actually the product of one part which contains only the spatial degrees of freedom. And then it's multiplied with a spin spin off. So this has a spin a half, and now it has a spin projection uh, up, which we give the quantum number one half. So remember now that we're dealing with spin half particles, and that means that I can have a projection of spin plus minus one half. And this function psi, one half, one half, is actually given by this spin over here, one zero. And then we have a corresponding one, and this is often written just like psi with spin up. And then we have the one half minus one half, and this is given by zero one. And we would typically label that one in this way. So just have a, a arrow pointing down to indicate that this is a spin down state. So what that means is that your wave function, this psi of t, is now going to be given by one over square root of two. And then we are going to have this state psi zero zero of R one multiplied with psi zero zero of R two here. And this is then multiplied with the spin part, which is going to have a spin up for particle one, a spin down for particle two minus. And this is where the answer is sim. The uh, spatial part is symmetric for the lowest lying state, and it's anti-symmetric in the spin degrees of freedom. So symmetric times anti-symmetric gives a total wave function, which is anti-symmetric. And so this is spin down for particle one here. So the let me just rewrite this a little bit better because I need a little bit more space. So this is the spin part, spin up for particle one, spin down for particle two minus spin down and then we have interchanged or swapped particle ones and particle two here then this uh, wave function ansatz uh, does obviously not contain a correlated part so this will be only the single particle piece so we would then have an uh, add a so-called correlated part correlation term And this correlation term is now going to lead to a new wave function. So we're going to have a psi of t, which is going to be given by a psi slater determinant part. So the function which we have here, this one, is actually psi sd. So if we add the correlation part, we are now going to have a, a c here for correlation. So this will be the correlation term. And that's going to be the full wave function in that case. So we will have a psi s of d, which will have uh, variational parameters, which are linked with a single particle degrees of freedom, like you had in project one. So the, you would have a single particle variational parameters. And we can label these, and we are just going to use one parameter. We can label that as an alpha. And the harmonic oscillator functions are then going to be given by this parameter alpha. And we are going to use uh, Hermit polynomials multiplied with Gaussians to uh, represent the single particle degrees of freedom. So this function, which I wrote up, this psi, if we now write psi uh, nx and ny, <coughs> as a function of r well let's just write it like this this is going to be given by a Hermit polynomial nx and it's going to be a function of x and y multiplied with a Hermit polynomial for y of x and y so this Hermit polynomials they depend only on one of the, de the degrees of freedom and then it's multiplied with e to the minus and then we have r squared and then we have a variational parameter, alpha squared, like we had in project number one. And then we are typically divide this by a factor of a half. So if you think back to project number one, 
the lowest lying state with nx equals zero and ny equals zero is just e, it's a polynomial which is equal to one. So essentially, then for this case where we place both the, the particles, in this case electrons, but it could be any spin half particle, what you're going to get then is a system where we place as an ansatz two particles in the lowest line harmonic oscillator state. So this would be the case for two electrons. So let's just mark that one. <clears throat> now, what we are going to look at is something which is uh, going to be called a filled shell system. And the reason for why we do that is that then there is only one unique combination of the Slater determinants, which uh, represent that system. That's an ansatz for the non-interacting problem. So feel free to stop me and ask questions if something is unclear. So if you then go to n equal to six, which is the next system, and the reason why we are going to do this is that when you now look at the number of particles you can distribute in a specific way, this gives a binomial factor due to the combinatorics with replacement, which will, uh, if you have a large number of states you can place the particles in, you will get an exponential growth of uh, these kind of slave and determinant arrangements. So just to see that, if you now go to the next case, so we have the lowest line state in the harmonic oscillator, nx equals zero, equal to ny. So just remind you of the energy. So the epsilon, so now I'm just skipping this alpha, is given by h bar, and then nx plus ny plus one in Cartesian coordinates, and nx, and ny, they take all numbers, positive numbers from zero and off. So that means that when I now look at the, the next system, I have a degeneracy. So I have nx equals zero and ny equal to one. And then I have nx equal to one and ny equal to zero. So this is gonna give me two new uh, single particle wave functions where both of them will have a Hermit polynomial of degree one, and where this Hermit polynomial apply either to X or Y as coordinate. What this means now, due to the Pauli principle, so the Pauli principle does not say anything about the single particle states. However, the Pauli principle states that the total wave function has to be anti-symmetric. Now, when you then, opt for this kind of single particle picture. What that means is that the consequence of the Pauli principle, which requires only that total wave function should be anti-symmetric, it means that you cannot have more than one electron or fermion in one quantum mechanical set of quantum numbers. So that means that here I can have a one electron or one spin half fermion. So we are going to confine ourselves to spin half objects. You can obviously have spin three half, five half, etc. But we are going to uh, look at systems which can be described in terms of electrons, uh, protons, or even ions, which have only spin half as a total spin. So that means that we can have one electron here with spin up and one here with spin down. So you can think of these as slots. And you're placing particles in these different slots. So if one of these is occupied, you cannot put another particle in it. That is a consequence of the requirement of the anti-symmetry on the total wave function. Then here, we can have the same. We can have spin up and spin down. And similarly here, we can have spin up and spin down. So this wave function, the single particle wave function, not the total wave function, is something you can now rewrite as a nx equal to one. So this is hx. Now the h zero for y is just one. So this is one, I'm sorry, zero for y, which is just one. And then multiply with e to the minus. And then we have r squared, which is x squared plus y squared. 
times of rational parameter alpha divided by two. This one, on the other hand, is going to be h0 x times h0 of y and multiplied with this e to the minus r squared alpha squared divided by two. And obviously, this one has to be given by h0 of x and h1 of y. And h1 is actually just equal to x or y. So this is pretty simple to program. And so are their derivatives. And then I also need this factor in here. So this will be for six particles. And then you would have a six by six determinant. So this gives a six times six Slater determinant, SD. So let me just remind you, this is a Slater determinant. So I'm spending a little bit time on this because the way we set up the system here applies also to uh, two other project suggestions. So applies to time-dependent Hartree-Fock plus the variant which we call copper cluster. So these are just suggestions of quantum mechanical systems. If you are more familiar with this type of uh, money body physics way of setting up the answers for the wave function, uh, you should feel free then to replace what we suggest as quantum mechanical systems with systems which are closer to your own research. So from a time point of view, if time is something which uh, is uh, pressing, this is actually the uh, uh, most straightforward uh, implementation of project number two, because the only thing you need to do is to replace the total wave function with a Slater determinant times a correlated part. So the correlated part is a part which is described in more detail in the text, and that contains also variational parameters. Actually, the example with the two uh, electrons is the example which I have used in project number one throughout the discussions of the implementation of important sampling, uh, blocking, uh, resampling techniques like blocking and bootstrap, and also the uh, uh, optimization part of the wave function. So if you uh, want to get started, uh, take a look at the, the lecture notes, which we had in connection with project one. So the lecture notes in project for project one did not deal with a bosonic system, but it contained the basic elements which you needed to include in the coding. So uh, this part here is what you would need to think of and set up. So we're going to look at n equal to two. We are going to look at n equal to six. And finally, we are going to have the next system, which is going to be equal n equal to 12. Now, one thing you should notice now is that if you look at this system we put up here, this system here, this one, this is a system which is called a full occupation. And that means since you have a full occupation, there are no other possibilities in, in distributing the particles. So remember the particles are indistinguishable and that's what's taken care of by the wave function ansatz, which we make for the fermions. So if you go back to the uh, uh, ansatz, which we made here, the indistinguishability is something which is represented here. We don't know, so this should actually be, there's a small typo here. This should actually be R1. So this uh, uh, column, which represents the particles, since the particles are indistinguishable, it means you don't know whether particle one is in slot one, two, three, et cetera. And the same applies to particle two, and the same applies to all particles. So the Slater determinant takes into account the fact that the particles are indistinguishable. So if you do that, then, and you distribute the particles, what happens then is that when you distribute the particles for uh, six, six particles and you have decided that you want to only use the uh, two lowest lying energies, 
there's only one unique way you can represent that system. So in general, what you have is the following number of the total number of Slater determinants. We have the number of Slater determinants, which is given by N, which is the number of single particle states and the number of particles. So N, uppercase letter N, is a number we reserve or labeling, which we reserve for the total number of particles. And what you have here, this is the number of single particle states, SP single particle states. And this is given by the combinatorial factor of the binomials of N minus N. We always assume that N this number n which you have is larger or equal than the number of particles. So this system, if you now have uh, something like a hundred single particle levels, and you have uh, six particles, then clearly the total number of Slater determinants grows dramatically. This is normally called the uh, dimensionality curse in uh, computational quantum mechanics or quantum mechanical studies. Because in principle, like for the harmonic oscillator, this number n, little n here, the harmonic oscillator has an infinity of bound states. So that means that in principle, n needs to be truncated when you're setting up a system. So what we are simply doing now is that we are making an ansatz for the ground state where we skip all the states which come above here and we simply focus on the two lowest lying energy states. And the second one has a degeneracy of two because they have two possible values for Nx and Ny. So I, only be, I'm, I hope you can excuse me for ranting on uh, this type of system, but we are going to use this type of system uh, for the time dependent Hartree-Fock project. And except that that isn't done in one dimension and it's simpler from uh, a, uh, quantum mechanical complication point of view. And it's also going to be the system we suggest for those of you who would like to do the copper cluster case. But again, you can always change these systems to those which are more relevant for your own research. Then the final one is with n equal to 12. And in that case, we can also construct a unique Slater determinant by simply looking at the harmonic oscillator energies, which we can have and the way we can distribute the particles then. So in this case, we would have Nx again equal to one and Ny equal to zero. And here we have Nx equal to zero and Ny equal to one. So the energy difference here is in terms of this harmonic oscillator energies, it's given by H bar times omega, the oscillator frequency. Now what we have, when we go to N equal to 12, we have a new possibility. So we can have now Nx equal to one and we can have Ny equal to one. And then we can have Nx equal to zero and Ny equal to two. And again here, we can have Nx equal to two and Ny equal to zero. So now let me just change colors a little bit. So we can have 12 particles here. In each slot, two particles spin up and spin down. So these are the quantum numbers which are allowed. And then I can have the same here, same here, and same here. So this gives us now a 12 by 12 Slater determinant. Now, there's a technicality for those of you who are interested in this system. And this technicality uh, is a technicality which is interesting for us because the Hamiltonian itself will not depend on the spin degrees of freedom. So that means that uh, spin will then be what we call a conserved quantum number. It means that uh, the spin degrees of freedom uh, are not relevant for us. However, we need to keep track of which spins the electrons have because 
that deals with the consequence of the poly principle. Uh, as a technicality, we can actually now split the Slater determinant in terms of a part where all the electrons have spin up only, and one part where the electrons have spin down. So the simulation we are going to propose is a simulation where we move each electron and perform the metropolis test very much in the same way as we did the uh, bosonic case, but we are not going to flip spins. So we are then going to rewrite this Slater determinant. So the SD is going to have a, a stick, in this case, a six by six spin up block. And you can show actually that the energy is left unaffected if the Hamiltonian does not depend on spin. So you can, for instance, place the first six electrons in a spin up block and the next six in a spin down block. You will ruin during the simulation, the anti-symmetries. However, the energy will not be affected. So the, um, the, um, these type of calculations are uh, calculations which uh, uh, simplify because then you don't need to flip the spins of the different particles. So you have a, a calculation where we only are dealing with the spatial degrees of freedom as long as the Hamiltonian does not depend on spin. If you wish to, you can obviously add uh, spin flipping as well. There is nothing which hinders you from doing that. So this type of system which we are suggesting, this can be reused, uh, or the setup which you see here, that can be reused for uh, the time-dependent hot fog project and also the copper cluster type of project. So that's why I wanted to spend some time on this. It's an extension of uh, project one. So everything you developed in project one, everything actually can be reused here. So that makes um, life a little bit simpler. Yeah, go ahead. I have one question. Uh, yeah. For the uh, NXS2 case, yeah. the, um, the Hermit's polynomials are chosen in a way such that the NS2 case is uh, orthogonal to the NS0 case. Yeah. yeah. Um, alpha changes due to the interactions between the particles, then no, we, we're, go we're going to keep the same alpha actually. So we're going we're to make a simplification. We're not optimizing alpha. No, we would be optimizing alpha, but only in the, so you could actually, you can do two things there. You can have a dependence on alpha in the Hermit polynomial as well, but you can keep the dependence on alpha. Uh, so the, the, actually, if you want to do this properly, you should have a alpha dependence in here as well, right? But right. we are just going to have an alpha depend. You can choose actually. You can choose to have the alpha dependence only here, or if you want to be more consistent, you would have an alpha dependence here and here. But if so, then in the second case, you just ignore the fact that the n is two and n is zero. Okay, um, single particle wave functions are no longer orthogonal. Yeah, but the the. Um, uh, you can actually construct them to be orthogonal. But remember now that the H2 polynomial is orthogonal by construction to the H0 polynomial. Doesn't it because assume, the H2... Doesn't it assume the, the width of the, of the Gaussian? You don't need to do that because the, the Hamid polynomial by constructions are orthogonal to each other. Hmm. So, but the right. uh, if you uh, no, because the, the, the polynomials are, are so it's the total wave function then, which would not be uh, so you're thinking of the total wave function, right? Not to commit polynomials by themselves, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah, That's so, so if you point. want, yeah, so the if you uh, want to be uh, really consistent here. You, you need to have this alpha parameter also in here and in here. Right, yeah. But the Hermit polynomials by themselves, they are actually auto orthogonalized. So you could also think of you now uh, simply uh, setting up in the wave function because this E2, if you keep this as a common factor, 
then you can just put it outside the determinant and then just have in the determinant the Hermit polynomials. So there are, there are, I mean, it's, this is something which uh, you can actually discuss. Uh, the code which I have, I would have the alpha dependence in the Hamid polynomials as well. So that means that when you do the, but there would only be one alpha parameter. All right, thanks. Okay, so uh, what I would suggest now is that uh, we take a small break and then we meet after the break and then I'm going to go through the, uh, the other projects and uh, discuss them a, a little bit more in detail and then you can see what kind of topics you would prefer and then I also need some feedback on what people want to work on because then we can also set up uh, the separate lectures uh, where we can meet and discuss the theory which is needed and this is the way we often done it uh, for the second project in order to give people this kind of freedom where they can link up things closer to their own master thesis topics, if that is doable. We still have to do something which has to do with quant computational quantum mechanics. So we cannot, we cannot just do, let's say, a project in astrophysics because that would defy the name of the course. Okay, let, let me uh, pause the recording. So to summarize, the, there are three projects which um, have a, a kind of similar quantum mechanical system where we uh, are going to deal with fermions. So the first variant of the project is a continuation of project one, and you can essentially reuse everything you develop for project number one. So the only technical difficulty then is to add these uh, slate determinants and then encode them in an efficient way. Because now, uh, when you look at the trial wave function, if we uh, uh, look at the metropolis test, what you end up with then is a metropolis test where you could, if you want to program things in an inefficient way, recalculate the Slater determinant every time you perform a uh, metropolis test. Now, doing that is highly inefficient. And one of the reasons why we move one particle at a time is that you can uh, rewrite the Slater determinants in terms of uh, smaller uh, terms, which then can be evaluated easily. So you don't need to evaluate a Slater determinant every time you have moved one particle. This is a technicality which uh, is related to a rewrite of a determinant in terms of subdeterminants. And when you take the ratios, you only need to uh, take into account the single particles which you have moved and then take the ratio between single particle states. Because if you want to evaluate a 12 by 12 uh, determinant every time you move a particle, so suppose you run 1 million Monte Carlo cycles and then you have uh, 12 particles it, this means that you would be doing something like a 12 million evaluations of a determinant. And a 12 by 12 determinant, a determinant in general, an n times n determinant requires n cubed floating point operations. So this is something you want to avoid. And the technicality, which uh, uh, is perhaps the only complication in this variant, is how do we implement this Slater determinant the most efficient way? So uh, let me switch back to the description of the projects here and then move on. So as I said, the uh, project which now deals with variational Monte Carlo for fermions is a continuation of the project number one, but with a new trial wave function. The same type of system is something which we would also have for the time dependent Hartree Fock variant, except that when then you're just going to go down in one dimension. So, this is something which uh, Eivind has developed. And for two years ago, when we run it, we had actually a pretty substantial group of people. We had five, six people who actually worked with this project only. And uh, 
uh, the uh, project here has a lengthy description. If you go to this link here and you move on to that, uh, you will find the different uh, tasks here. And in this specific case, there is a scientific article which uh, we are going to reproduce. And this is uh, an article by Zangelini. And uh, that is a simulation of a time dependent uh, uh, problem uh, using Hartree Fock theory. So, this is something which uh, may be more relevant for those of you who have studied many body physics and also those of you who come from material science and are familiar with the density functional theory. So Hartree Fock theory is a slightly simpler variant than the density functional theory of DFT. And time dependent DFT is something which plays a very, very important role in the studies of dynamics of the quantum mechanical system. It's a mean field approach. So that means that you will not uh, treat correctly all the correlations. So Monte Carlo calculation is actually treating correlations better. However, uh, this is something if a system is weakly correlated, which often takes happens with the electronic systems, if you're looking at molecular physics or atomic physics or quantum chemistry, uh, the system uh, is governed by some kind of external potential which traps the particles and uh, electrostatic interaction like the Coulomb interaction. That means that the, uh, uh, for those of you who are um, more into this kind of study direction, this project could actually be of interest. And we've always designed it uh, because we have people from quantum chemistry, we have people who are interested in the dynamics uh, of quantum mechanical systems. So the dynamics is essential if you want to simulate, uh, for instance, a the simulate theoretically how a quantum gate and quantum circuit will function. Or if you just want to study the response due to an external field on a quantum mechanical system. So uh, I won't go that much in details here, but you can actually follow it and you will see now the single particle basis here contains very much the same uh, as we had before. So we are going to use a harmonic oscillator except that now this is a harmonic oscillator in one dimension. So there's only one quantum number, and this is this NX. So you could, if you wanted to, you could uh, look at uh, this system without the external field. So this represents the action of, let's say a laser acting on a field, on a system, and it's uh, uh, a classical electrical field which is acting on the system. So it's not a quantized electrical field, just to simplify things. We are assuming then that this is a good approximation. And then the one body part of the Hamiltonian is simply a kinetic energy in one dimension plus the harmonic oscillator. And the potential here, in order to avoid the divergence at the, in positions where xi minus xj are equal to zero, there is a kind of factor here, which is often called a screening factor or shielding factor. And this is just to avoid the, the divergences. And this is the potential which was used by Zangelini. So that means that for a different number of particles and trapping frequencies, we do actually have a, a system where we can compare with the paper which we have here. And uh, what Avin has developed is actually uh, the way we can discretize and set up the, uh, the matrix elements of uh, the one body operator, which we have here, and the two body operator, which is the Coulomb interaction. And uh, we are going to look at something which is called restricted out report. So if this is of interest, and if you're dealing with uh, uh, density functional theory, this is, and you want to understand a little bit more about time dependent density functional theory, this is actually a very good way to get started. So for those of you from uh, material science, this could actually be a very interesting part, if that is of interest. Okay, so I'm going back to the projects. And normally what we have done then is to form project groups and then discuss the theory separately. So this is something which we like to do, but it it's, gives us an extra burden because we need to set up extra sessions, but it has been functioning. So that's the uh, uh, these projects. 
there is also another variant here, which is essentially you taking project number one and replacing an, the trial wave function which you have with a neural network. So I wanted to say something about that variant as well. So in this case, uh, we are going to uh, define uh, so-called generative models. And we are going to look at uh, a deep learning method, which uh, where you actually keep generating your input. And these are called Boltzmann machines. So this will be the first stepping stone. So what we are going to do then is to simply replace the uh, Hamiltonian, which we had. And we're going to start with the uh, one dimensional, two dimensional and three dimensional system. But we, instead of having uh, the bosons, which we had, we are going to replace that with a system of fermions. But we're only going to look at two electrons. Now, if you wish to, you could now replace that one with a wave function you had from project number one. So there's nothing which hinders you to change the type of system we suggest with systems which are closer to what you want to do. Uh, the reason why I bring this up is that you have codes in my lecture notes for project number one, which essentially do a variational Monte Carlo calculation with blocking, with the optimization, with the important sampling for this system. So you can actually reuse all these codes. The thing you need to change is actually the trial wave function. And this trial wave function will then be replaced by a neural network represented by these so-called Boltzmann machines. And this was actually the paper which uh, really set off deep learning applied to solution of quantum mechanical systems. And this has created, since the paper came in 2017, it has actually created a kind of mini revolution in money body physics. So I wanted in this project to suggest that we try to implement the Boltzmann machines because they are, a, well, I shouldn't say straightforward, but they are not that difficult to implement. And you can lean yourself on, on the codes which we are going to discuss in the lectures. And then when you feel that these uh, uh, applications are functioning well, we can then, and this is something which I leave as optional, we can then replace the Boltzmann machine with a neural network. Actually that one, replacing with a neural network is much more efficient than a Boltzmann machine and gives better results. So we are coming back to that. So we are, have the possibility here to catch many birds with just one stone. Uh, but what we need to do then is actually to go through uh, the theory of Boltzmann machines and uh, neural networks. So if this is a project which is of interest, then uh, we should form a, uh, or we could have lectures, regular lectures. And this is what I've been doing the last, the last year. Last year, I lectured about Boltzmann machines and uh, neural networks and how to solve these quantum mechanical problems. So the uh, uh, system is again a kind of harmonic oscillator and you can see now you would have, and this goes back to the question which David uh, asked before the break, uh, if you want to be a little bit more careful with the uh, parameters. So in this case, we would have a, a, an oscillator frequency omega here. And so these uh, wave functions, these Hamid polynomials need to be modeled uh, with a, the parameter which we are setting in that is omega or alpha as we called it. In this case, we're just gonna put in an, an omega here and we can vary it if you want to. And then there's a normalization constant here. So we are going to uh, simply use uh, a two uh, particle system just to simplify things. So we will put the electrons in the two lowest line states. So you see again, the kind of system which we discussed before the break, this uh, uh, electrons confined to move in either one or two dimensions is a system which uh, you will see again and again in the different projects here. And in this case, we're gonna put that one to zero, X and Y, and we're gonna put H bar equal to one. So that means that the energy is just this frequency omega here. 
and uh, you need to convince yourself that the, and you have seen this already in project number one for bosons. So this problem here, except for the correlated part of the wave function is identical to the two boson case, which you had in project number one. So I didn't want to bring in uh, two complicated quantum mechanical systems because that requires uh, a little bit more work. And uh, not everybody has taken a course in money body physics. So hopefully the systems here are a little bit more straightforward. However, if you uh, wish to, you can always add uh, or reinsert project number one and uh, exchange the trial wave function which you had with a Boltzmann machine and then later a neural network. So uh, the uh, type of uh, wave function ansatz uh, for the two electron or the two boson system is then given by this function which you see here. And then we are going to represent, so we need to uh, run through some lectures then where we now discuss the Boltzmann machines. So this will contain some technicalities which we need to discuss. And uh, I would suggest then if this is of interest, you just send me an email and then we can meet uh, next week and on and have these as part of the regular lectures if there is a uh, large interest in this one. And there are different types of these types of Boltzmann machines. So the first thing in order to get you started, guys, if this is of interest, is actually to bring back project number one and then uh, implement these uh, uh, emit polynomials. So you could actually get started here without thinking yet of the Boltzmann machines and the neural networks. So the preparatory part is actually something which is aligned with the project number one. So I have designed many of these projects so that you can actually reuse uh, what you did in project number one. So the theory here is something which I would like to discuss a little bit more in detail uh, in lectures. And if there is a good fraction of you who want to do that, then uh, we could have dedicated lectures almost for the remaining part of the semester. I see the, okay, so there is a uh, chat. So you guys send me an email uh, about which topic you find the most interesting. And if there is a good group of uh, three to five people, the lectures we are going to have for the rest of the semester will focus on that. And you see now what I did is also, so I focus on the Boltzmann machines because they are a little bit easier to implement, but, and I made the uh, neural network piece optional. And this is simply due to time. This is, this course has 10 credits, unfortunately. And uh, it means that uh, depending on where you are towards the end of the semester, you can then jump into the neural networks. I will discuss that in lectures, but if you don't get time to implement it properly, then uh, you can just leave it out. So these are just suggestions from my side. Okay. Any more questions about uh, this topic? Things you like to bring up? Okay. So the uh, if there are no questions, and if there is a, uh, enough people who are interested in that, uh, I would then suggest that we uh, use the rest of the semester to discuss Boltzmann machines and neural networks apply to the solution of quantum mechanical systems. But I, I need uh, some feedback and I'm gonna send an email to everybody because I would like to hear your opinion of, of, about these things. So we've discussed this project for Asian Monte Carlo, the time dependent heart refock is also something we have discussed. And now I wanted to say something, so there's a typo here. This should be copper cluster theory. This project here, uh, is actually a project where I would recommend uh, it only to people who have taken a course in many body physics. So this is really uh, a topic which requires some more knowledge about uh, many body physics and many body methods. So 
the copper cluster method is actually a uh, traditional money body method which is widely used in quantum chemistry nuclear physics atomic physics molecular physics solid state basically all uh, physical systems where you solve either a, a non-relativistic or relativistic quantum mechanical money body problem and it's a method which is very popular it gives a, a very good agreement with experiment in uh, many many applications and it is a method which you can systematically expand upon in order to bring in more and more correlations so this uh, uh, money body method uh, again takes into account this uh, two-dimensional uh, harmonic oscillator which we discussed before the break so it's exactly the same system however as i say here uh, these systems can however be changed to other ones and uh, the other ones could be for instance a nuclear physics problem where you often use a harmonic oscillator as a starting point and in that case uh, i can provide you with the uh, matrix elements which can be used the um, it can also be linked with a a hartree uh, initialization of the system so hartree fock theory is a simple money body method which is often used as a kind of kitchen item in order to get a better basis it's a variational method and it normally creates a uh, it gives you a, an expectation value of the energy of the ground state of the system which normally is closer to the uh, true value which we want to reproduce and it gives a better basis single particle basis which then is reused in many body methods so copper cluster theory is a so-called post hartree fock method but you don't need to use a hartree fock basis i mean if you're familiar with these things uh, this is something which then can be implemented but only if you're familiar so my job here is actually to make sure that uh, you 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 don't break your neck by adding too many things so I know that there are people doing many body physics in their thesis. So you will see again, there's the same type of single particle states, which you have in, in the other project we have discussed. But uh, uh, the uh, quantum dot case uh, applied to the solution of uh, the copper cluster theory is something which uh, actually requires that you've done many body physics or that you're starting your thesis work and this is the money body method you want to implement. So this can always serve as a very good starting point for a, let's say a master thesis. And we've also had people from quantum chemistry uh, having to code the copper cluster method as part of their uh, startup for the, either the master degree or the or PhD. So I won't say more here, uh, but this is one possible path. And as I said, I want to emphasize this this is a project which requires that you have some knowledge in many body physics and that you have gone through things like uh, hartree fock theory, full configuration interaction theory, some uh, many body perturbation theory or similar approaches, or Green's function theory, if that's uh, the many body method which was taught. Okay, so that was uh, the fourth variant. Then there is a quantum computing variant. Uh, this follows to a certain extent a, another course, which is called Physics 54519, which uh, is deals with quantum computing. And uh, this is also a topic which requires that you have some knowledge about quantum computing. So I designed that because I know that there are people who have been interested in that and it implements a method which is so it has a nice overlap with this course here so it it, it follows actually this course physics 5419 and uh, there are some recommended lectures uh, from week 10 and week 11 and there is an article here which implements a method which is called the variational quantum eigensolver and this method described here and the variational quantum eigensolver is basically a variational method like the variational Monte Carlo method. And you need to calculate gradients. But now you need to calculate gradients of a Hamiltonian. 
which uh, has been rewritten in terms of Pauli X, Z, and Y matrices. And there's actually a scientific article here by Maria Schult, which uh, gives you the expressions for calculating the uh, Pauli matrices. It's set up in a sense that you can use a popular software, which is called Qiskit, or you can actually develop everything yourself. This is also fully possible. And in these lecture notes, you will see actually how you can build up these systems. So the quantum mechanical system, so when you do uh, computations with the quantum computing algorithms, you then represent everything in terms of qubits. And qubits are the way we are going to set them up. They can be represented by a spin up and spin down spin up, for instance. And these are eigenfunctions of the sigma Z matrix, which means that you often then want to rewrite a Hamiltonian in terms of the sigma Z and sigma X and sigma Y matrices. The sigma X and the sigma Y can be rewritten in terms of a sigma C matrix. So this is a simpler system where we have a Hamiltonian, which is a two by two Hamiltonian like this. And we rewrite that one in terms of poly X and poly Z matrices. Actually, there's something which went wrong here, but your Hamiltonian interaction part has a diagonal matrix, a poly Z matrix and a poly X matrix. And then uh, the first one is just to solve this by standard eigenvalue solvers, which uh, can be done analytically because it's just a second order problem. And uh, you just calculate the square roots and then you have the solutions. The uh, part which becomes interesting is that you can uh, set up this in terms of either Qiskit, which is a popular software for doing quantum computations, or you can actually set up everything yourself. And the next part is a Hamiltonian, which now becomes a uh, two by two Hamiltonian. And it's gonna look like this. And this H of X, so this is the sigma X matrix. So just a tensor product of a sigma X and a sigma C matrix. And this is a quantity which then can be uh, solved by a quantum eigen solver. And so you would have to compute the eigenvalues using standard eigenvalue solvers first. And then the next step is actually to use the VQE method, which is a variational method where you then would vary the angles of a, a qubit on a block sphere in order to find the optimal energies. So this project here requires in a way that either you are familiar with the, uh, what we have described here, or there is a, or if you have taken a course like uh, uh, MAT uh, 3420, which is called quantum computing. So these two last projects, which I have designed, they are more tailored to people who have some basic knowledge from the beginning and are interested in solving these type of problems. And the uh, basic literature here is based on the, this review article on the variational quantum eigen solver, which is one way to find eigenvalues in the what's normally called the the noisy error quantum computers. And then you would also need to calculate the gradients of the Hamiltonians in order to optimize the variational parameters. So again, here you can reuse, the nice thing here with this project is that you can reuse the uh, gradient optimization you developed in project number one. The only difference now is that you would have uh, the angles which represents the way you can uh, set up a single qubit on the so-called block sphere. And varying these angles, you can then find the variational minimum. So it's a variational optimization problem at the end. But you need to rewrite the Hamiltonians or the matrices you want to diagonalize in terms of sigma X and sigma uh, C and, si and sigma Y matrices. So this defines roughly uh, the projects which we have cooked up. Uh, you should, however, not feel limited by what we have cooked up. So if you have some other ideas or things you cherish, I mean, please let us know actually. 
So what I would like to do now is uh, the next 15 minutes before we switch to the lab. And I would suggest that today we, we look through the projects, we can discuss them and internalize and figure out what we would like to do. And then uh, uh, send me feedback. Uh, if the, and if there's a majority of people who would like to do the Boltzmann machines, we're going to have separate lectures on that. So please feel free to, I'm, I'm going to stop the recording here so that the discussion